Hi, welcome to PH Dizzle. I'm your host, Alice Chang, and today we are interviewing Karin Johnny, who got his undergrad in physics and astrophysics from Penn State, his PhD in astrophysics from Georgia Tech, and is currently a research professor at Vanderbilt University, and he studies black holes and gravitational waves. amazing to see you progress through your academic career because I've known you since Penn State. I remember getting butter chicken with you and walking around campus with you. I mean, I always knew you were into physics then, but can you just tell me a little bit about physics and, and how you got into it? What was your inspiration for getting into this field? So I, I, I came to Penn State uh, for my undergraduate in astrophysics uh, as an international student from India. Um, I could not study astrophysics as an undergraduate there uh, because no institution was offering such specialization in the undergraduate level. And I was one of those who was, you know, get infatuated reading the Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time, think that this is perhaps the coolest thing in the world to do if you get a chance to study it. And I really wanted to formally study the universe. I didn't want it to be a popular science or a pseudoscience or science fiction. I genuinely wanted to understand the tricks and the experiments that allow us to make the inference of the universe. Uh, whether you, the question can be very philosophical, being like, oh, how did the universe start? Or what is the age of the universe? You know, what does it mean for us to be a temporal species in this sort of almost infinite space time? I wanted to have a a, a very uh, rational answer to these questions and hence I came to Penn State as an undergrad and of course in an undergrad you don't have a much refined vision of what the field is you are interested and you take the first physics course and like myself I just scored awful mm -hmm. and I thought that I cannot do this uh, for a lifetime because uh, I'm just not that good at physics you know even if I'm interested in this kind of questions uh, to answer and uh, I'm fortunate that at Penn State, um, I was able to push myself uh, beyond, you know, the skills I perhaps had, uh, just learn basic physics, you know, spent more time in Davy Lab than I think I spent anywhere else in, in on campus. Uh, and uh, halfway through the course, I realized that a degree in astrophysics is very limited because mm -hmm. I'm more interested actually in physics. And so I decided to double major. Mm. And, uh, that's how at least the basics start. After you went to Georgia Tech, so you eventually survived the physics and seems like you did really well because you got into grad school. So tell me about your research and, and you actually went to a lot of different universities also because you did, I think, part of a postdoc and did a lot of research collaborations. So uh, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, like what you studied in grad school. So I started as actually a, as a freshman. Uh, I started uh, working in a lab at Penn State. Uh, with a professor who was working in this experiment called LIGO uh, and he was what is, very... What does LIGO stand for? It stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's uh, one of the most uh, um, sensitive experiment designed by humans. It is perhaps one of the most successful experiments that are running currently on, on Earth. Wow. Uh, it is the most uh, ambitious project funded by the federal government till date. And where is it located? Uh, it's uh, one of the experiments is in Louisiana uh, okay. and the other one is in Washington. Okay. Um, the one in Louisiana is where I was partly during my PhD time as, a, as an on-site fellow. But uh, as, a as a freshman, you know, I had very little ideas of what gravitational waves is. Of course, you've just cleared the intro physics test barely. And I reached out to this professor and I said, look, I'm interested in doing research. And uh, so the pencil had, at least the physics and astronomy, had a very nice culture that all undergraduates should be doing research mm -hmm. parallel to you know, whatever you are majoring in. And so I started this group working there and I worked in that group for the four years in different projects within gravitational waves. Uh, in between, I spent one summer at the Albert Einstein Institute in Germany in Potsdam, close to Berlin. And one other summer, I was at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. It was in my junior year, uh, where the legendary Stephen Hawking served as the research director. So I was able to know enough about the field 
that before I was going to go to grad school, I sort of precisely knew who I wanted to work on, mm -hmm. what I wanted to work on, and had a sense of uh, the scale. Because in physics, the experiments are generation to generations, right? It takes you be a part of one theory, and it takes almost fifty years to be to be right or be a part of such experiments to prove it. So I joined Georgia Tech in a very sort of a strategic move, almost compromising with my aesthetics of learning physics to more of seeing what can be done in physics during my grad school. And it just so happened very timely as my thesis was on finding this newer class of black holes, um, type of which uh, were the first black holes to be ever discovered by LIGO. Uh, and so I was part, during my, much of my grad school was trying to prove this hypothesis or rather a key prediction that Einstein had about a hundred years ago mm -hmm. on the nature of space time. Okay. So space time, it just like sounds very cool, but I, I don't know what it means. So can you tell me what is like space time theory and what, like what's a black hole mm -hmm. and um, can you time travel backwards <laughs> or forwards? Like what does yeah, that mean? The, the third one is the hardest. Uh, well, I'll start with the simpler. So Einstein in uh, 1905 uh, revolutionized physics by making a prediction or very mathematical understanding that the universe is four dimensional, that the time is very much a part of a uh, uh, dimension, like how space is. You cannot treat time as a, a sort of a uniformly moving uh, one way street. So for example, we are used to thinking that my clock and your clock takes the same way because of course that's how time works but then Einstein said no if you had someone who's at the if you had your twin brother or twin sister who's separated by you at the age of 10 and put into a rocket and when you meet after another 20 years you on earth would be 30 years of age but your twin may be 25 mm. and it's not that your biological clock changes it's it was very fundamental concept of time is different for different observers and he took that concept further in 1915 when he said that gravity is not a force, but it's just an emergent phenomena that comes out of uh, time being uh, space and time can curve. Like it's not a uniform cube, but it's more uh -huh. like a whole thing. Uh, so if you are close to uh, an object which is big, the whole space time bends there. And that is why you experience what you call gravity. Okay. So wait, are you saying because space has less gravity, the time is different there? So the whole space time, you can think of it as this vast ocean and everything is embedded in the ocean, all the objects in the universe. So if you put a cannonball in water or in a, let's say in a trampoline, like that's a classic example. You put a cannonball on a trampoline, you can see the whole trampoline sort of bent. Mm -hmm. And then if you use a, a smaller, let's say a golf ball, just to and throw it, it would just go around in an orbit. It would not sink in right away. It would just keep going on in an orbit. Hmm. That's the same thing happens to an earth when it moves around the sun. Okay. Because the sun actually curves the space time. Oh, interesting. So Einstein predicted this in 1915, but it was only in 2015 with the experiment that I and my teammates were working on we were able to prove the very essential part that yes, indeed the universe is a four dimensional space time. And because as soon as you have um, like a gravity as this sort of curvature, it has this waves. Hmm. Uh, so think of, you know, why do we see light? We see light because electrons are accelerating, they accelerate and they release radiation. That's why you see light. That's why you feel heat. By the same way, if you had a massive object which is moving in the ocean, it would create these ripples. So when objects in the universe move, like black holes or stars, when they are moving, they create gravitational waves. Okay. And he, Einstein knew, but then he dismissed by saying that, okay, you can never find it because it's so weak. Yeah. And it is indeed one of the most challenging things in modern science to have found over these years. But you guys have found it? Yes. And uh, the, is that through the LIGO experiment? Yes. Okay. That was the only experiment. So there are two experiments now in the world. One is LIGO, the two experiments in the US. And there is another experiment, uh, Virgo in Europe. Okay. Then there is a, a new LIGO being built in India. 
right. uh, which is the reason why I was invited to meet with the prime minister oh. to talk about it and there is one more which has just about to get started in Japan uh, it's called Kagura so there is now a network of such experiments across the globe that is happening but the first one to work was the was in the United States okay so tell me about the experiment like what 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 are you looking for like what is the experiment and how do you prove that a graph gravitational wave exists yeah so it so gravitational wave has a very unique way of interacting with us uh, so what happens is when a gravitational wave passes through us it literally stretches the entire space and shrinks it and stretches and shrinks it so you can imagine your palm literally like moving and coming down Mm. But your eyes cannot record it because everything around you also changes by the same effect. Oh, I see. So there is no experiment you can easily put because that experiment also gets influenced by the effect of gravitational waves. Okay. So instead we rely on a technique called Michelson interferometer where you allow lights to bounce between like 4 km length. So you have this L shape of 4 km by 4 km the light keeps bouncing between the two mirrors as soon as gravitational wave comes the distance between the two mirrors increases and if your and light is always the same no matter where it is so now light takes this extra um, 10 to the power minus 20 meter extra distance it has to travel mm, okay and we are able to see that distance because of interferometry so it's it's a very small when you're talking about like your the things that are pulsing it's a very small pulse. Yes, it's smaller than even the size of the proton. Okay. Wow. So you it guys is. figured that so you guys could measure that with the light waves for the Yes. Light waves. The effect is 1000th the diameter a millionth the diameter of a proton. Okay. Wow. And uh, that, the fact that we were able to measure it uh, is a milestone of human scientific achievements. Yeah. But it also took um, a good 25 years. So the experiment was started uh, constructing in 90s and it was taking data since 2000. Mm. And in 2015, uh, it got its discovery. So it's a very long wait. Uh, and the founders of the field won the Nobel Prize in physics for that in 2017. Wow. So okay. my Penn State advisors, PhD advisor, uh, Kip Thorne, who also co-wrote fun fact interstellar movie oh really yeah <laughs> that's amazing one of the uh, founding fathers in our field yeah i am in academic lineage his grandchild oh that's awesome so you worked on the ligo experiment so we and we talked about space time and gravitational waves we haven't talked about black holes yet explain black holes and then tell it and then you can tell us like the, the bigger story of what your research was on so uh, black holes are this uh, objects you know now very famous in pop culture mm. as the objects you know which in which if you have anything inside it can never escape the black holes are a natural solutions to einstein's equations so if you have an einstein's space-time um, theory you can find punctures in space-time such that what we call singularities where all known form of physics breaks down Oh. Around it is a shell which is called event horizon and no information can pass outside event horizon. There were indirect evidences that the universe has black holes but we could never measure really this event horizon around the black holes to be sure about it. Mm -hmm. So my PhD thesis was to take Einstein's equations and uh, try to understand the dynamics of what happens when two black holes come very close to each other and it so happens when two black holes come close to each other they release this gravitational waves mm. and in fact they release more gravitational waves as energy than light from all the stars in the universe combined at that instance wow it's a very powerful event when the two black holes touch and then they radiate those waves across the universe in LIGO expands on September 14 2015 these waves arrived on Earth oh. from one such collision of black holes. And when the, we saw the signal in LIGO, we compared it to the simulations that I was doing part in my PhD thesis at the time, and the systems matched. 
Wow. Okay. So you had ongoing research at that time yeah. and you, and you were basically building kind of like a database or like not a database, but kind of like a, I don't know, a map. Simulation bank. I math. Okay. Um, and then you compared your results to when they actually saw it. So in a sense too, you were very lucky because it happened during that time in yes. your PhD. Yes. Yes. No, I'm, I'm absolutely very, uh, lucky to have been in the right space time coordinates. <laughs> Space time uh, joke, astrophysics <laughs> pun. <laughs> and uh, so I had started working on the detector uh, just before we had discovered. So I was partly working on the understanding the data, uh, but I wasn't. I uh, not I. I mean, most of us were not expecting that. At least in my PhD lifetime, yeah, to see something of this nature, because uh, these things are very rare. Like these signals come from billion light years away. Yeah, and they are like not just further than our galaxies or cluster we are talking about halfway through the universe the signal comes wow so it happened did you guys know right away you're like you because you're like doing the data and you're like oh there's like a blip let me just call like ligo and like you know ligo's like oh there's a blip and then you're like yeah let's go out for a drink or like how did you realize that was right yeah, so there's this whole collaboration that I've set of scientists about thousand scientists working on ligo experiment uh, each working on different aspect of it. And uh, over the next six months, all of us collaborated and wrote papers. And on February 11th, we announced it publicly to the world that look, we had seen a discovery of this nature. So a lot of scientific work collaboration that happened between almost dozen countries, universities, like about 80 universities, all of us working together and writing you know, sections, paragraphs, of this big papers. Science is like playing golf. You may have mastered all the clubs in golfing skills, but on the day when you are on the range, on the course, uh, there is this element of luck that influences mm -hmm. your games in ways that your rationality almost breaks down. So when I was in my around third year of grad school, I got this uh, Sam Dunn Fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, which is funded by the MacArthur Foundation and it's by the uh, the International Affairs School at Tech. So that trains uh, some six to eight PhD students into policy and, uh, oh. and uh, international relations and uh, science and tech from a national security perspective. So that by far was my most enriching experience in grad school because until then I was very narrowly focused on, of course, this topic I'm working on. And then I was suddenly exposed to what gets science funded Yes. Because there is one thing to say that, oh yeah, this theory is important and it takes, you know, Albert Einstein's theory further. But then there is another thing to ask taxpayers for a couple of billion dollars and say that, look, you know, we have to fund the science. You mentioned earlier that you've met Stephen Hawking and you've also met with Narendra Modi, who's the Prime Minister of India. You've gotten to meet like very influential people. Is there anybody that you want to meet that you haven't met still? Well, I'd like to meet Elon Musk uh, for the reason that uh, a lot of projects that we work on require a very ambitious scale, mm -hmm. like very innovative way of thinking, you know, how you're going to solve it. And uh, if anything, he has shown in a very characteristic way that uh, some of these very lofty goals can be achieved in human time. Like, it's not that we didn't know that we can make better rockets. It's yeah. just we know we can do it in like five years, ten years. Yeah, and he championed that because there was no kind of voice championing a lot of these initiatives, right? Yeah, one thing that I truly admire, uh, and because I've seen that happen in physics, is that when you come with a very revolutionary idea, the field and the experts of the field, you know, some of the brightest and the biggest minds, uh, tend to be your biggest obstacles. Mm. Uh, cause, uh, and that happened with building, let's say, a gravitational wave detector uh, like LIGO. For a long time, people thought like, oh, come on, this is not worth it. Yeah. Uh, you don't have it. But then we still proved it right. And that sense that he has also had, because there were experts, there were the first astronauts who thought that a commercial space flight would not work. Mm -hmm. And here we are in 2020, in the year of pandemic, we have a commercial <laughs> crew success. Yes. You're now a research professor. So tell me, I mean, and I know, I don't, I don't even know what's going on right now since we're in a pandemic, but tell me like, are you teaching? Are you doing virtual? Like, how are you doing research now? Um, in an ideal scenario, like what would that research look like? Yeah, 
So I'm I mostly have students who I work on projects and my colleagues here at, at Vanderbilt. Uh, so I'm mostly very much on a research focus and I don't have to teach at the moment. Okay. Uh, I and so the Vanderbilt has this very nice uh, bridge program between a Fisk University close to Vanderbilt is one of the historically black university which has a very strong physics program and we have a set of students from there who are in the astronomy bridge program here doing mm. their master's thesis so there is a wide range of students i can work with in terms of you know different projects which is i i really love doing that i really love having uh, students working I, I i enjoy having five projects parallelly going on <laughs> <laughs> I think because a lot of problems in physics you hit the roadblock very soon. Mm. And uh, so having this multiple projects going on allows you to be time and again like I have few weeks I'm only working on this one crazy idea which is not going to be proven for another 30 years. Yeah. I love doing that and then you suddenly come back to reality it's like no I have to do something which is more pressing proposal deadline this year. <laughs> but to be published before that. Yeah. Uh, so I I I love having that sort of a spectrum here as a, and uh the flexibility that i can work on almost anything i want at this point that's amazing the broad spectrum of uh, the field called multi messenger astrophysics wait uh, that, multi, say it again multi messenger astrophysics okay now explain it <laughs> yes so uh i told you about two black holes colliding and releasing gravitational waves and now if you were to look at the same objects with telescopes you may not see anything because black holes don't emit light Mm. and even if they do it so so weak that you would not be able to look with traditional telescopes but there are other instances when a two neutron stars collide and when they collide and we have actually proved that in 2017 uh, that when two neutron stars collide they release gravitational waves but they also release light across the electromagnetic spectrum they release radio they release uv they release visible light and from there we have found actually how the universe makes gold and uranium So oh, when the fact that we see gold and uranium or any of plutonium or any of these heavy rare earth elements on earth they are not born out of earth they are just mm-hmm. there and neither of our sun makes it neither a supernova can make it so mm-hmm. the only reason they exist here on earth is because some sort of neutron stars are colliding in our galaxies materials from which that eventually got deposited on us the word multi messenger is that from same source you have multi messengers that tell you the stories so some stories are from gravitational waves oh. some stories are in light and then you could also have neutrinos and uh, the neutrino detectors on earth can find so you know like the spectrum of different messengers okay completely so, different physics of them so basically you your research is like all encompassing across many different modalities and is there a particular top like are you studying in particular like black yeah. holes or in particular a subject yeah so there is this a uh, class of black holes uh, called intermediate mass black holes intermediate mass black holes yes okay and it's intermediate is because it's not like the big ones that are at the centers of our galaxy like this beautiful picture of a black hole we took last another team took last year uh huh then that black hole is a billion times bigger than our sun and it's sums of size and a lot of black holes that we right now find are only about 10 or 50 times bigger than our sun okay and they come directly from stars okay. but in between there is this mass gap and uh, for a long time people thought that universe does not make black holes there so my focus is absolutely in trying to find black holes in this mass gap mm. what i've been working uh, pretty much since my phd Okay. So so black holes just like a, I don't know this it could be a stupid question but you said things kind of just disappear into a black hole. So does it ever become like not a black hole? Like is it ever like resolved or forever it's just this like disappearing into a Bermuda triangle type of thing? Yeah, it's very much like that. It's a uh, black holes essentially are like nature's final state. If anything goes inside the black hole the existence everything is just permanently lost you know the identity that something exists wow. in the universe is permanently lost after that because unless you are not looking at it there is no way to know what went inside it 
So if you were to go into a black hole, would you know that you were in a black hole and just still exist in there? But people outside don't know? Sorry, is this like getting to, it's like if a tree falls in the woods, would you hear it? So the very concept of what happens to space and time around black holes, you know, that starts sort of uh, getting fuzzy. Okay. So before even we would reach black hole, we would sort of stretch and become like spaghettis, uh, you know, before even we will try to hit in it, just because of the extreme gravity of the object. Okay. So the gravity between your leg and your head would be so different on the surface gravity. Load. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, all, I mean, that is what we think. Um, but that is assuming Einstein's theory is correct in predicting what black holes are. And okay. we don't know that for sure. Okay. We know that it is true, just like how Newton's theory is true in predicting how an aeroplane works. But that doesn't mean Newton's theory can predict um, GPS. So there is always a connection to the one theory that makes the next theory grander. Yeah. And uh, one of the goals of physics or modern science is to go beyond Einstein's general theory of relativity. So you have spent so much time studying these problems about the universe. What what have you done kind of like, you know, I guess on, on Earth, like for you personally, in terms of like your hobbies and how do you spend time when you're not thinking about these like really big problems? Sometimes the hobby is uh, as mortal as this like binge watching Netflix, which is a hobby now. I think. That's a hobby. Know. Yeah. Netflix <laughs> and chill. <laughs> yes, that's true. And video game campaigns on Xbox that I would like play for hours. So that is very much being part of my hobbies. Other than that, uh, I am a big fan of Indian classical music. The principles of Indian classical music are almost in the same complexity as quantum mechanics, where you think you understand it, but then you try to read more and it comes to think, I know you don't understand it. <laughs> so it is founded on music theories, which date almost back to 1500 to 2000 years. Wow. And it still sticks to that theory as a whole. So for example, the classical music has a concept called Raga mm -hmm. and Ragas is associated with time. And in that time, it tries to evoke a certain mood. So okay. morning raga is very different than an afternoon or an evening raga. It is a set of seven notes or six, seven, seven notes within which you can only stick. Unlike Western classical music, Indian classical music is not fixed. So if you're, even if you are re performing a rendition, you have all the liberty to play it whichever way you want. Mm -hmm. The only thing you have to stick is with the raga. That's kind um, of like maybe like jazz it is very much like jazz yes okay okay and you and in terms of indian classical music are there also like instruments associated with that so yes. and i and do you play one of those instruments i, I do <laughs> learn one of those instruments <laughs> a sitar. okay it's a seven piece uh, seven string instrument in the front and then in the back it has about uh, 13 strings mm-hmm Altogether, it's this complex 20 strings instrument, which was made very popular by uh, Ravi Shankar, who used to play with the Beatles. Ah. Uh, and uh, they were one of the first to bring that instrument to the Western side. It has a very particular sound, which almost no other string instrument can replicate. Are there other things that you like to do? You said some of your work kind of leads into your hobbies as well? Yeah, so I'm very interested in education policies. Okay. And uh, a lot more in education policies in India. Now, when I look back and see education, especially K-12 education, I can see how many mistakes they make mm. and how much further improvement we could have. Uh, especially, let's say things like teaching programming from middle school. Um, instead of teaching math the way they teach, I think a lot of math should be taught just through computers. Oh, interesting. I am a very strong proponent of the idea that we don't need to memorize uh, tables or anything in mm -hmm. mathematics. Uh, we should always teach kids how to write a code to predict the next prime number instead of memorizing the next, the first hundred prime numbers. That's like an engineering mindset, which is also why I went into engineering. I couldn't ever remember the, the value, but I could always figure out how to get there. And if you can figure it out, I think in, in life, that makes sense because in life, you don't have to memorize what a certain number is, yeah. what a certain thing is. You just have to have logic. And that's how you solve problems when, and a lot of problems don't have an answer yet, you know? So you have to figure out how to get there. Very glad to see, like, you know, how there's a movement now 
in academia to, to stop having GREs as a, a lot of schools have stopped at taking SATs now too. Yeah, and I think it's it's this is what shows uh, maturity in education. Yeah. By being part of universities in India and educational institutes, I try to influence in whichever way I can uh, this kind of policies to make it less colonial than mm. it is right now. I would say that the K to 12 in in India is very rigorous, especially the high school years. It doesn't take the all the students up with it. Unlike mm-hmm. an American education system, where you can still have like almost a fifty percent of the students who would graduate, you know, like every year, can solve the problems from the last year. Okay. And that's one metric, right? You want to know if a tenth grader can solve ninth grade maths or not. Yeah. So you have many people who are left out, and only oh. few progress further. So I I studied for a year in India in a university, and I went to equivalent of just taking my high school scores mm-hmm. and going there. was not at all a very competitive school a school uh, but it has a rich history and one of the india's only nobel laureate in independent india came from that university wow so maybe you'll be the next one too far to think well, on <laughs> we'll check in i'll check back in in 10 years it might be sooner <laughs> i have to do like a check i have to check in with you like every decade because then it's like i lose track of all the things that you've accomplished i'm like oh my god <laughs> i only ever see you in the news now it's phd as well having fun with smart people who do cool things <laughs>